And you guys see how's the volume? Can you hear us okay? I can hear okay. Great. great. Okay, thanks. I can hear. Excellent. All right, very good. <laughs> then we'll get we'll get going. All right. Well, thanks for coming. Um, we're going to do kind of a, a brief overview of this virtual exhibit that we created last year. Um, and we're going to uh, preface that by saying that the actual exhibit will be up above us in the galleries uh, opening on May 21st. So we have a virtual version online that shows the artwork and puts together a presentation with the history. Um, and then upstairs, it'll be turned into panels with the historic texts and photos, and then plus the artist's work, uh, which has been coming in every day over, over the last few days. Um, so it, it's a small group of artists, nine visual artists, and then one group of poets. Who we worked with to help tell the story of uh, racial tensions, really, in DeKalb County in the, in the early parts of the 1900s. Michelle and I started working together on this in the summer of 2020. 2020. Mm -hmm. um, put together more of a title of we want to do something, we want to get for the community, we want to see healing, we want to see growth, but we don't know what we're doing yet. So we just came up with a title, Arts in Action. And from that, we had about 12 pages of ideas of what it could be as a project, and it turned into this very project. The last thing I'll say before I turn it over to you, Michelle, which you can kind of get, get things rolling again, and that is we partnered with Family Service Agency and NIU on a Healing Illinois grant. And um, through that, we were awarded $5,000, and that $5,000 is to pay uh, $500 stipend to each of the participating artists. So we got some money and then we gave it all away. And then we got the, the deadlines for the project and we were told, all right, we have three months to complete this work. Because the state of Illinois wanted to see positive things happening very quickly uh, and, and dealing with racial tensions especially. So uh, it was a race for us and it was kind of a race for the artists. But in the end, what we created was this, this project that we're gonna look at. And as a historian, Three months to do an exhibit is horrifying. <laughs> but we also knew that it was a conversation we needed to have. So our approach to this was to be very much the tip of the iceberg um, and an opportunity to start the conversation. Because we knew waiting five years when we felt a little more comfortable with finding research and stuff, that wasn't the answer either. So this uh, project that was created here was definitely something that was um, know, done faster than we normally would do, but it also opened up the opportunity for a lot of other funding, and that's kind of how we'll wrap up the conversation today is what's next. So um, with this grant that we received from the Illinois, Illinois, that allowed us to get funding from the Illinois Humanities, um, so they are helping fund the exhibit, um, as well as a website that we are going to be launching in July. And that will take this information and, and all the other material that we have added to the story um, in the past year, um, as well as some more history clips. So that next step is really gonna be robust and allow people to continue this dialogue. We um, also have funding from the Community Foundation and we're gonna be using that for educational resources. Uh, so the, especially that the students in Sioux Health County can see themselves in their own history. Uh, we also have a grant from the Mental Health Board, and they are funding a project coordinator and an app that will help us connect these stories to specific places in DeKalb County, and then um, another part-time community engagement person. So we give the, as time allows, we'll go into a little bit more of those in detail, but it's just what we hoped would happen is that this would be a springboard. It has happened, and we've been able to Forward. This is certainly something that we don't see as like, okay, we're done. We had the conversation and now we're going to move on. Uh, this is something that is um, becoming part, it's a touchstone to all the work we do at the, at the History Center. And, and it's certainly a dialogue that, um, you know, the Elwood House is, um, you know, this is a conversation we're having with everyone. Um, but it's been exciting to see the support for this kind of work happening. 
and then typically you know the way i like to work the way michelle likes to work is we envision a big project and all the components of it and then we write a grant for fifty thousand or seventy five thousand dollars and you know go from there and this has been just the opposite little bits of money kind of trickling through um to extend the project out but i think for in our case it's actually been beneficial because we're learning from all the steps that we're taking and it's a better project because of it. So it's one of those cases where I'm glad we didn't just get punched in the and said, do good. Right. And do it in a year. Exactly. You know? um, and I think it also reflects our approach to this project is one story at a time. That's been, um, this has really been a whole shift in how we approach our work, to be honest. Uh, you know, normally everything, especially in grants is how many people can you get in a room? How many, you know, participants, how many, and this is, it, it's slow and steady and that we don't want to rush through this. We want to have important conversations with people and be respectful and it, it, we need to build trust. We can't just go in game busters and um, then it, that's just not what this conversation requires. So it, it has been very much of a, of a change in how we've approached things. But as Brian said, it, it's been working out. So, uh, so far so good. <laughs> And then one thing that we've kind of acknowledged from the beginning, Michelle and I, is that it's not necessarily our story to tell. Um, we're certainly tied to the, the, the history of the area, and we are the directors of the various museums within the county, but we're kind of approaching it from a, an area of privilege, of white privilege. And we're trying to then expand the stories out so that anyone can curate their own story. And that's the, the second kind of iteration of that, where we're going to have the website, and we're going to have apps so that people can tell their own story, one picture at a time, one document at a time, or one uh, oral history at a time. That's another part of the project. Um, so we're trying not to be too controlling, which is really hard for me. <laughs> um, but we're also trying to involve the community as much as possible in telling various stories. Michelle and I don't always work together. People think that we do now that we're just kind of <laughs> tied at the hip because we're at NIU together all the time giving presentations and, and talking about this project. Um, but before this, we weren't necessarily tied uh, as far as our programming goes. And even though Michelle covers the entire county as the DeKalb County History Center, the Outward House is just a small part of that. But as we get into this, I'll tell you why the Outward House is really involved and, and will be involved. So should we flip open the page? Yeah, the only other piece I wanted to just make sure is that, um, again, Brian and I have kind of been the faces for this, but there's been so many people behind the scenes. So we had a committee um, with, uh, and, and different community stakeholders that we've had conversations with the whole time. So as Brian said, we have the framework with our organizations to present this. But we have been working with a lot of people that have really shared their stories or given us like, you might want to check this out. You might want to look over here for some more information. So it's uh <laughs> we've learned. Yeah, yes. we've learned a yeah. lot. We've learned a lot. Yeah. Um, this page isn't terribly helpful, especially for you at home, but um let me just move this out of the way. It's just an introduction page uh, to our exhibit, and it goes over um, kind of how we started. And it talks about the four themes of fear, exclusion, community, and hope. And we'll launch into those as we flip through this booklet. Um, the only thing that I want to mention from the cover was the, the artwork that we saw there. And that was by Terrence Gray. Oops. Cursor. All right, so it's kind of a recognizable piece, is it not? <laughs> Uh, we've got two people standing in front of a Gothic revival home. Maybe there'd be a pitchfork in the original okay. uh, Grant Wood piece. Uh, but here we have a, a young Black artist who painted this. Uh, and he's depicting a young Black man, a young Latina woman, and a shovel. And they're, they're ready. It's breaking ground. They're ready to dig in. They're ready to form a community. They're ready to form lives together. Uh, and they kind of want that American dream. And I think Terrence is, he's a really um, interesting guy. He delivered his work yesterday. It was hard to even like let him leave the building because I wanted to talk to him. Uh, he's a professor. He teaches out at uh, Blackhawk College in the uh, Quad Cities. 
and he did get his NFA at NIU. Most of the artists here have, and um, he's just a good guy. And he, he he likes to help people, and he likes to train people in the arts, and he works with um, a bunch of different students in his community, um, and he teaches them artwork like, almost as a sense of healing. So, some of the materials and the content in here are, are difficult, um, difficult for us still, and we've given these presentations over and over again. Um, it's, it's not necessarily because it's tied to this location or this area, uh, it's just the, the national story of the time, um, but it, it does affect this area, and we're talking about the Ku Klux Klan. Um, really starting to show up in Cal County in the 1920s. This is kind of the, the story of the Great Migration and uh, Black families coming from the South up to Chicago, uh, the suburbs. Uh, they weren't just coming to large cities. Uh, we have a population of uh, African Americans moving to Sycamore uh, very early on, the 1900s, 1905, 1906. And that is the story of the Great Migration of people moving north. But what happened throughout the north during this time period is groups like the Klan came together and said, you're not welcome. Uh, you're not wanted. And what they did was they infiltrated um, the areas and worked with local churches to give presentations. They put together, like our ad here, a gigantic open air celebration. Here are ads by the Klan saying, hey, come see this big event. We're going to have free fireworks. You know, they're just trying to get people to come and show up. Uh, and then they'll uh, try and indoctrinate, indoctrinate people um, with their um, hatefulness, honestly. And the one who said here that, again, we've been learning. So the Savitz Field, that's where this happened. We weren't sure where this is um, on the east side of Sycamore that the Asian road. Um, but it wasn't there. It was actually the Saban Farm was quite large, and it was um, off of Airport Road. They're all soccer fields up. So um, again, we it, there's so many words to you know the feelings that you go through uh, in this exhibit. So here is the the fear and that hatred, and then you can see you know obviously we have work to do today. But those soccer fields you see kids of all different backgrounds that are out there playing together. So we have made progress. We're, we still can do better, but we had that, the history of that place right there has just changed so much. Um, it's just a really powerful example of change in our community. And then just to give you an indication, the first um, plan rallies mostly were in Rockford. And then shortly thereafter in Sycamore in 1924, there was a rally. Um, the population of Sycamore at the time was around 5,000. We had about, what was it, 12 to 15,000 people yeah. who would attended that rally. Now, I think some people attended just to see what was going on, you know, because it's advertised as entertainment. Uh, we don't have you know, firsthand accounts of what, uh, what transpired and, and what from it. If, if maybe hopefully some people walked away and said, oh, this is not for me. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, lots of people are attending these various uh, plan meetings and rallies um, throughout the, the Midwest. And again, some other information we found out since we put the exhibit together is that we have pictures of uh, plan members at a parade in uh, Fairdale, and they don't even have their faces. And the full plan outfit, and we know, um, I know Christy's on the call here in Genoa, they have a plan charter there too. So it wasn't just Sycamore, it was um, communities throughout the county. We have some newspaper clippings, I believe, of a meeting in Chabonon. And so again, these were um, the time that these were all, this actually, this was going on. In the 20s, yes, that was their heyday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to talk about the artwork really quickly. Um, her, her work will be in the exhibit for sure. This is a big painting, about four feet tall by three feet. And it's about the Green Book. And it's a contemporary Green Book. So the idea of where you can go and how you can travel to kind of navigate the United States by car 
Um, what Angie Redmond, the artist, is saying here is she's she's really hopeful for the future, um, and, and she's looking forward to the future. And she painted this greenish blue background. She said as a hopeful color, a bright color, and she's walking into it. But she left the left part of the canvas where her hand is kind of unfinished, and in the uh, canvas, kind of written with almost like a sharpie. It, it's a contemporary green book saying she doesn't necessarily know how to navigate this current world we live in, uh, but she's hopeful and willing to try. And it's just a really powerful work, even of course more powerful when you see the canvas. Uh, What's the size of the frame? You said it was yeah, four feet by three feet. So it's a it's a big canvas. Uh, Angie again just graduated with her MFA from NLU. Um, already really accomplished um, artist, winning some awards in, in Chicago at various galleries. Uh, and she's, uh, she's just great. She's great. So if you go to come to the opening, she's going to be here. Some of the artists can't make it because they're from other parts of the country, but she'll be here. Um, and then we want to say one thing about the Klan uh, in the 1920s. And I can't remember the number, but at one point, membership for the plan was up to like 4 million people um, world, uh, nationwide. Um, but it was the Great Depression that pushed it down because people couldn't afford to pay their membership fees. So I always say that if there's one good thing about the Great Depression, it was they held the plan back uh, because they made their money through not only membership fees, but by selling booklets, uh, paraphernalia, um, swag, we would call it. Yeah. Swag. Yeah. <laughs> And then on that note, there's also, though, again, in conversations that we have with people, at least that have lived, lived in Sycamore, there's two people that we know of that in the last few years have received invitations to join the Klan um, as, as intimidation because they were people of color that received this in the mail. It's, and one person even saved it and shared it and provided a copy to us. So it's just that we've made progress wow, this is still going on. Some people still think this is okay. Yeah, so to get that membership letter in the mail, uh, and it was, I saw a copy of it, and it was this really kind of cheap photocopied hundreds of times mm -hmm. sort of letter. It's almost like we're watching you. This is the feeling you get from it when you know that it's being sent to someone of color. That's just really, really horrible. Uh, and it's intimidation, and that's how they started, and that's what they continue to do. Um, of course, the Klan in the South is, you know, a whole other story with more than just intimidation. Uh, this is still about the Klan. We have various advertisements uh, that we've captured from the Sycamore True Republican. Uh, it would be in additional newspapers as well. We just have um, easy access to the True Republican. Aaron Coleman's work will be in the gallery. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about, I wasn't going to, but I'm going to talk about this really quickly. Um, his artwork is really interesting. He, um, he's a professor now at the University of Arizona in uh, Tucson. So he won't be at the exhibit, but his work will be here. He found a, a 1950s coloring book one day. Um, I, I don't know if it was a thrift store or what it was, but it was this found object. And what he did is he took the pages and kind of broke the book apart. He said it was it was yellow and brittle, and you can see how the edges had flaked off of this piece of paper. And what he did was he overpainted it with the with the black pigment, and then he used the white pigment for the background of the fields. And then what he did is he eliminated text on the page to tell a, a new story. And I won't read the words. You can do that when it's in the in the gallery. Um, but all of his work, this is a large series, it has to do with race. This one typically uh, or specifically has to do with Klan. But what I like about it is Aaron said that uh, his father had recently done some um, DNA testing and found that he was from uh, Ghana. And the pattern, you can sort of maybe see there's a pattern on the screen there, uh, is the pattern of kente cloth that he has kind of inscribed into, into the artwork and built up layers. So again, I know it's hard to see when it's flat on the screen, but you can see a little bit of backing patterns and a little bit of gloss from the, the buildup of the paper. So he's putting a lot of his own story into that piece.
And then Michelle, sorry, if I can keep going a little bit. Okay. Um, exclusion. And this is where um, the Elwood House becomes involved in this project more than more than the rest, honestly. Uh, and it was because of exclusion that I contacted Michelle in the first place to say, hey, we need to work together on something, or please work with me on something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is um, racial covenants. We found that the area directly behind the Elwood House here, called the L Field Edition, uh, had a racial covenant in place. And in 1925 uh, or 24, I think it was 25, um, the Elwood family, the second generation, uh, that we will Jenny, uh, Perry and May, Perry and May from the mansion here, um, sold off the lots in the neighborhood behind us and developed them. And with it, put in a racial covenant that said only people of the pure white race can own property. You can still have someone living on site as a chauffeur or help, but they can't own the property. And when I read that, it was just a, kind of like a punch in the gut because, you know, I've been here for 11 years and been interpreting the family, and I had no idea that I would come across this. And I, I still wasn't the one who found this. I was told about it from people in the community. Um, because it's still associated with those deeds. So if you go through your property deeds and you know, go back quite a ways, you're going to find it in there. Um, they're no longer legal, thankfully, but um, they are there. Uh, and the Supreme Court outlawed them, what was it, 1948, um, but it still took a while before there was any sort of enforcement. In 20 years. And we know from uh, research done across the country that anytime there's a neighborhood that once had a racial covenant or exclusion of some sort, it's still typical that the families living there are white you know, because it takes a long time to start incorporating white people in those communities because if you always know that you're not allowed and invited, it's kind of just one of those, oh, we don't go there sort of neighborhoods. And I know that the, the Elfield edition today um, it's a very open community. You know, I know a lot of people who live there uh, and would not mind, um, but um, there's there's always a problem of inviting people of color to move into a community that once had a racial exclusion of some sort. And, and that's that's what we're finding across the country. Uh, Minneapolis uh, public um, television one hour episode on on racial exclusions and covenants. And it's, if you have a chance, check that out. It's, it's a pretty nice um, presentation. But we're finding uh, racial covenants throughout the county. Uh, there's one in Sycamore, the, the Fox edition. Which is right across the street from Sycamore High School. So again, you, you talk about just educational opportunities. This isn't something that happens someplace else. This is something this is right where these high school kids that you see that same vision. Um, there's others around. We we found what maybe four or five, and then just kind of like, okay, we know they're there. You know, we're moving on to other parts of the project. But if we if we put together a team just to explore that, we kind of know what to look for. If you look for housing uh, development that was done in the twenties, chances are pretty strong that there'd be some sort of racial inclusion in the building that uh, included in the, in the covenant with you. The other kind of surprise though is that we found that in some cemetery records. Also had similar restrictions, um, both on color and religion. So if you were Jewish, you would not be welcome to be buried in some of the cemeteries. So we have two cemeteries, I think, listed in the exhibit here, and one of them uh, had Henry Beard buried in it, and um, the Fairview Cemetery, and he was uh, celebrated as the first black settler in Sycamore. Um, he came after the Civil War. He was an uh, undercook for um, one of the regiments that went through Kentucky, and he ended up living in the cow that um, and buried here. Uh, his wife did a laundry um, time. She is not buried there. She is buried in the Elmwood Cemetery in Sycamore. And I always oh, thought that yeah. was really cool. And now, um, what's going on? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, I just had a creepy experience. Um, okay.
So anyway, that's just one example um, of one cemetery that um, also it, um, took those those beliefs, and even when we're dead, we're still going to be threatened by um, someone of color. Yeah, that was a surprise. That was definitely a surprise. I didn't think about that separation 19, and death. <laughs> that was 1951. Also, that was not in the 20s. Um, before we go on to the hope side of things, I want to talk about the artwork on the left, uh, which is talking about racial exclusion. So um, on a more personal story, this is Agnes Ma, who created this work for us. Um, Agnes um, grew up in DeKalb, went to uh, NIU, got, his, got her from the Bay there. She's now a professor in, in Denver. And um, Agnes lived here on site for a number of years and was our intern kind of museum curator. And I called her when we were starting this project and I said, Agnes, I'd really like you to produce a piece for our exhibit. And she said, you know, I don't work in that social, social justice realm. She's really interested in biology and she was pre-med at one time and she's interested in environmental works. And I said, all right, so let me just kind of lay the scene here. I said, the, the Elwood Nearing House in which you lived when you lived here uh, is technically part of the Elf Book Edition. So you would not have been able to own property. As a Chinese American, you would not have been able to own property. And she's like, that makes me really mad. <laughs> I said, uh huh. I thought I'd like. And I said, so what about you know producing a piece of artwork for this? And she's like, let me think about it. And she hangs up the phone. And then the next day she called me and she said, how much space can I have? <laughs> so her installation is going to be floor mounted. It's going to be like eight feet by four feet by, I don't know how tall it is, but it's these um, kind of little miniature uh, laser cut pieces of. Items representing, and if it's white, kind of it's representing the elephant edition. And then as you start to add color around it, and Agnes works in a very muted um, color scheme. So for her, this is like terribly intense color. Uh, and even this is starting to get like a, a little bit more color than her own juice. Uh, but the idea is that she's creating this, this pure white center and then she's encroaching upon it with colors and, and culture essentially uh, and she'll she'll tell it better than I do but um, she'll be here next week um, she's traveling with her piece and she's going to install it thankfully uh, for us because I did not want that to come in a box but via UPS and, and put it together based on her direction um, but anyway that's Agnes's work about exclusion go ahead let's move on to hope Michelle but as we were going through the exhibit, you know, the research, like we didn't want it just to be all these difficult um, stories that we also wanted to show that resilience and that hope because that is equally important um, part of the story. So here we have about the story, the Great Migration. Again, Brian kind of touched upon that, but we have the story here of this founding uh, factory newsletter for Anaconda. They had a section called One of Us that uh, they highlighted different workers. And one that they highlighted was Weaver Johnson. And he worked there for over 19 years. He was a member of the American Legion. And um, he, his story is the Great Migration story. He came up um, after his uncle uh, sent him or talked to Anaconda. They were looking for, um, it wasn't Anaconda yet, but came Anaconda. They needed um, labor, sent him a free train ticket in Georgia and then came up and his wife and daughter came up and they also ended up working there as well. Um, what is one of the, one of my favorite parts of this project is one of the people on the committee, uh, you may know Virginia Sherrod, we shared the story and she was just in tears. She's like, that was one of my dad's best friends. And the fact that he is included in a museum exhibit just is unbelievable. And it's like, yes, his story is very important and we need to do a better job of telling more stories like that. Um, so again, it's, they talk about how his job was one of the hardest jobs in the factory and he worked there for 19 years. It's like, why didn't he get a promotion? You know, he, probably, he was known as a hard worker. So again, it certainly wasn't perfect, but it was a place that um, it was this triangle of success um, in that um, North Avenue neighborhood. Um, they had the Israel of God Church that was um, very um, had a, a very strong role in the Black community. 
they provided housing, they helped um, work with the bank. Clifford Danielson provided loans, which was very unusual, so people could buy a home in that neighborhood. And then many of them worked in Africa. So it's um, a really interesting story and um, a big part of that hope and, and resilience. It was interesting since Virginia was on our committee, we were having a Zoom call in the, the early days of putting the project together and presenting this information. And of course, like Michelle says, she starts crying here on our Zoom call. And it was like, uh oh, okay, what do we do? I'm, I'm sorry, like, we'll fix it. Whatever we did wrong, you know, we'll, we'll fix it. And she's like, no, 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 this is good. These are good tears. Go, okay. <laughs> because we were, you know, hypersensitive to putting this material out there in the first place. Because we don't want to cause harm. And and that's and these and that's the balances of there's some really hard conversations we've had with people, especially as we've done these oral histories. And um, but we also did Brian was there for one last weekend where the woman described it almost as cathartic. This was this was part of the healing process of telling these stories. So um, it, it is that's again to reinforce the hope and the community part of the author exhibit is really important. So this section, these are the pictures I mentioned, Jerry, that you maybe might recognize. These are from the DeKalb Journal. And this touches upon, and this is the only documentation that we have of the migration story um, for the Latinos in DeKalb County. So um, as the Great Migration was ending in the 1960s, that is when the Latino migration story began. And um, this is different because many of these Latinos were working on farms. So they were not in town. They were um, just, they were removed from the daily life of the community because they had run the board and they were, they stayed there during the harvest season and then they moved on. Uh, the work here um, of, uh, it was called the DeKalb County Migrant Ministry. Um, was established to help out some of these families to provide some health services, some daycare, because as you can see here, there's some small children that were, um, you know, staying at these homes. And, um, uh, and it was, uh, then, and then they changed into 4C as the migrant community permanently settled here in DeKalb County. I'm not sure I have to look at the screen over here for those numbers, because they're big number of here, but it is like over 150% increase like in the in the settlement here in DeKalb County um, during this time period. And again, because um, they weren't necessarily living in the downtown area, um, it was it was more of a gradual um, that more incorporation into the community it was much slower um, at the beginning, but then all of a sudden it's like, you know what? And what, this is really what was more research we need, need to do is what was that shift? Was it um, more factories like the Monty that they were able to go and work on there? We haven't found that. What was that switch that's like, no, we're gonna stay here. What opportunities provided themselves that they were able to, um, to, to make that a permanent home? In doing this research as well, we've gone through a lot of the old census records. It was a good COVID project for one of our volunteers. And she went through from 1850 to 1940 and she's, has a deep dive into the 1951 that was just released in April. And we see this throughout DeKalb County. Uh, we've been working with the Kirkland Historical Society and in Franklin Township, there were over 35 Mexicans listed in the 1930 census. Where were they working? Were they working on a farm? Did they just capture them at that moment? Because uh, they're not in the 1940 census. And there's also a large Mexican population in Chavanaugh. So again, these are all questions that I have like, okay, where were they working? Were they working on farms? Were they working on a factory? Um, how, how did that happen? So it's, um, Brian and I wish we'd been able to um, tell more of the Latino story. Uh, we just haven't gotten there yet. We've had just some more leads and um, more conversations with the, the black history because in many ways it's been here longer, especially with that community in Sycamore. Whereas the Latino community is newer to DeKalb County. And um, I, we both feel bad that we haven't been able to take that deep dive yet, but it, we're working on it. Um, we'll and, get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so this piece here is um, one of my favorites. Uh, I can't wait to see it in person. This is on a pillowcase. And if you see here, it's got um, this lining right here and that's barbed wire and red, so red lining. And 
very lightly, you can kind of see this trace though it is a house. And you've got the flowers and the big pearls there that um, it's that hope and that connection to community that no matter what is going on in the outside world, we still have a home and this is, we're gonna do what we can with what little we have. It's still gonna be a place where we have our support group and where we're gonna be here for one another. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's proud, it's safe, uh, it's, it's home. And, and just as a side note, you know, Juan is the artist who created this piece, and I contacted him to be a participant in this project. I didn't know, I never had met him before, but I saw his work online, and he's, he's a photographer. <laughs> and I really liked several of the photographs that he had on his website, and when I reached out to him and said, you know, we're going to send you the themes and some of the history of our county, and we'd like you to somehow create a work that ties into that. And I'm expecting a photograph, and, and I emailed him a, a follow-up maybe three weeks later and just said, hey, Juan, just checking in, want to know how you're doing with your work, and when I can maybe expect to see something. And he said, oh, uh, literally, I'm just finished sewing it up now. I was like, <laughs> okay, you know, that's great. I'll see it soon. And then there's the digital image. It's like, he made a pillowcase. <laughs> uh, not a photograph at all, but it is, it's a really, um, he put a lot of thought into this piece and it, it is, it is interesting, the story he's telling and the uh, research that he did in order to create it, not just using our own materials, but uh, books that he read along the way. So, um, really great. Community, we already hit on a little bit of the North Avenue neighborhood in Sycamore. Uh, and just so we were all clear, that's that um, area just north of Route 64. Uh, so if you're downtown and you go California North, then you run into North Avenue. Since I don't live here locally in St. Charles, North Avenue is 64. So it took me a long time to realize like, okay, this is, this is a street just beyond. But I knew that neighborhood because I've always been fascinated by it. And I would drive through and wonder like, what is this all about? And finally, you know, I had a good reason to investigate it further. I hope no one in the community thinks I'm stalking them because I still drive through it because I'm so interested in it. Um, but it is, you know, an early um, kind of inclusive black community in our county. Uh, and it still is for the most part. I mean, there's, there's, there's a mix of races there, but um, it's just fascinating that it was such a stronghold at a time when uh, blacks weren't necessarily welcome in Vitale. There's all this talk about Vitale being a sundown town. Is it or is it not? Uh, we've never found anything conclusive uh, other than stories that we've collected from people who have lived here. And they say it was, we were not welcome. The, the, the story we're told again and again. And um, there was a professor who was visiting um, NIU uh, but to live here, uh, residential. And he was not given a place to live, essentially. And every time he went to check out an apartment, he was told, no, it's, it's no longer available. Eventually, he found his way to North Avenue and um, the church, essentially, uh, was renting out housing there and said, of course, of course you can live here. So that's changed over time. Uh, our perceptions of where people can and cannot live. Um, for the Israel of God Church on North Avenue, um, they created housing there it's something called the barracks where people can actually come and stay uh, and that's because they do uh, an annual uh, almost retreat for the church uh, they weren't allowed the the black ministers who were coming to Sigma weren't allowed to stay at hotels or somewhere. Uh, they had to stay on site and on the property so that's almost why that community evolved uh, and, and why the church owns so much property today they're the national headquarters for the Israel of God Church. So in August, they would have this conference of between 20 and 100 people. So the pictures down here are with those bishops from throughout the country, mostly predominantly the Midwest, um, but then they would come to Sycamore to maybe a different location. Yeah, they also have stories that I used to have said, you know, this is the only place that they can stay. Yeah, Jeff, you want to Well, I think it's going to Mayo as well as give to Cal County yeah. and Brown Bag One. Um, right. So this um, also tells again the story of the Latino community and 
you know, some of how we've all benefited from some of their cultural, um, you know, traditions. And uh, we have a story here of Christina Garcia. Her family was one of the first Mexican families to settle in Sycamore. We've got a picture here of her with her brothers. And then um, the Cinco de Mayo festival that happened part, as part of Tasco for many years. Um, there are some pictures there with the traditional dresses um, from the young women and then the, the boys as well with their sombreros and um, doing their traditional dance. And um, my goodness, I mean, that was just, it was like two days for several years. There was just such a great community response to it. And, and I think that just wanted me to show how we all benefit from worrying about these other cultural tra traditions. And we got a quote from Jesus before yes. he left town, Jesus yes. Romero. Um, and he was just talking about how important community is. And it's it's a famous quote that he said over and over. And Michelle called him to say, you know, we know you've said this before. Is it okay if we share this project? And he went just verbatim, said yeah. it out loud, yeah. knowing exactly what she was going to ask him, um, that how community makes, makes the home, um, makes everything possible. So that's our, our story. Um, and I just want to say, within the text of this, and kind of ongoing, we're doing two things. We're using the word Latino, we're using Latina in some cases, and also Latinx. Um, what we found is that, yeah, a lot of people have embraced Latinx as being the, the non-gender form of the word. Um, we've also found that a lot of Hispanic people don't accept that. Uh, they prefer Latino or Latina. So we're, we're kind of using it interchangeably right now. Um, as that changes over time, we'll, we'll update and change as well. Again, not being part of the culture, sometimes we kind of scratch our heads and say, okay, what, what is acceptable or what is not? <laughs> and what's changing, so. Yeah. I'm so close to story, but if you wanna just um, talk about the resources for the people. Yeah, so um, two things. Um, most of the times when you go to an exhibit, you don't see like footnotes or references. We always have that information available to you if you want to know. Uh, but in this, we really thought it was important to list our sources here because um, a lot of people that have lived here maybe even for generations have not experienced these stories. And some of these are like, well, I've never heard that before. And so it's like, that, absolutely, this was not your world, but that doesn't mean that this didn't happen. So we do list all um, of our references over there. And then um, the acknowledgements and resources, again, we wanted to thank everyone that helped us um, with the project. And we also wanted to recognize the fact that these are some, these are really hard things to see and to read about. And uh, we worked with Deanna Cato over at the Cal County Mental Health Board in trying to create some of the sources for people. So if this does, you know, if you have trouble processing any of this, there are resources here available. Um, and we encourage people to, to have those conversations because um, you know, even sitting in these world histories, I, I, they're not my stories, but I'm there listening and I'm still thinking about the stories that were shared days and weeks later. So. Um, at the end of the flipbook, we just have a list of artists. I'm sorry, I keep saying in front of you, but um, it goes through their work. There's a bio about each of the artists and what they wrote up about their pieces, um, which is a lot stronger than what I'm, I'm telling you um, in my summarized version. But I'm just going to flip through this and we'll, we'll ask for any questions here in just a second. That's the photographic you were expecting, right? That was the same artist? Different artists. Oh, different, different artists. Different artists. <laughs> uh, we have two wands in the exhibit. Right. One is a Fernandez and one is a Fernandez. So sometimes we um, get a little confused, but Juan photographed the uh, old anaconda plant in um, Sycamore off of North Avenue. Uh, but it's, it's an altered, it's a digital image. So it's a, it's a little different if you don't recognize it. Uh, four Poets, One Mic is a team of five poets who did sort of spoken word poetry for us. Uh, we'll have that on a, a video screen in the exhibit. Oops. That was Terrence Gray's other work. Young Black Wishes.
protagonist's work. Um, this is a video that was created for the project, the Comeback Machine. It's about an eight minute uh, video. Uh, Jadicus Neal is the only undergraduate art student from NIU involved in the project, and she served as an art intern for a semester as well. Um, so we kind of included her to um, give her, first of all, the experience of helping to coordinate the exhibit, but also a chance to exhibit her work. So um, everyone else is either um, you know, master's degree or, or professor at this point. I'm sorry, I know at home that these uh, pages are hard to see. Uh, and our last artist is Jacob Van Loon. Uh, Jacob also lived here on site for a while. Jacob also would not have been able to own property uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, this is a parlor view uh, in Jacob's style, um, but it's, it's showing kind of a, uh, an opulent interior with a, a kind of a solid masonry wall out the back. And he's talking about the idea of of exclusion of where one can live and where one can't and, and perhaps what your view may be or, or is not, you know, the, the view of a brick wall. And that is the, the end of our artists included. Uh, we would have loved to have included, you know, say 20 artists in this show, but again, as far as time, we didn't have the time to coordinate that. Uh, we didn't have enough money to give everyone stipends for that. Uh, I do recognize that it would be stronger if we had additional artists, but these artists are, are pulling a lot of weight. They're, they're doing the job for us. And I think we have a really good um, kind of summary of, of their individual kind of backgrounds and thoughts towards the work. Uh, and it was a good platform for us to then tie on to, to tell the, the local history. And that's just kind of where I think we uh, want to end it with an open up to questions is that art was, just I think, and I give Brian full credit for this, was just I think a really great way to start the conversation. Because when we look at artwork, we all look at it from a different perspective and that's not threatening. We can say, oh, this is just amazing. And then you can say, really? Because <laughs> I think, you know, I could do that. And we don't get mad at each other. Where it's like, oh, that's kind of funny. You think of, you know, that we have a different perspective. And bringing that into this history where it has been very divisive lately. Um, it just kind of like, okay, wait, no, we can have different perspectives and it's okay, we can have a conversation. Um, and that a lot of people have lived in our communities and that means there's that many different perspectives about those experiences. We just as an organization need to do a better job of making sure we have that opportunity and make it a priority to tell those stories that we haven't been telling before. So, Yes. I'm really excited about the opening of this exhibit. And thank you for giving us sort of a snapshot, if you will, of what we're going to see. I'm really excited to, to see it. Um, my question is what, if any, interaction has this exhibit uh, add with the big belonging initiative that was initiated, I believe, out of the city of DeKalb and NIU. Right, right. Um, so I served on that committee to kind of be the startup for the belonging. And we were creating this in tandem with the belonging startup. So for the belonging committee, we're meeting Wednesday nights and we're trying to put together kind of a strategic plan of how that would get off and, and, and start running. And Michelle and I were just finalizing this, what I call the flip book, um, as that committee was ending the, the startup phase. And I presented it to them one night just so I could get more feedback. And it was great to have immediate feedback from a whole host of different um, people from different backgrounds. And of course, there's a, a large amount of NIU input to the belonging committee. Mm -hmm. um, so through that, Michelle and I were invited to a lot of different, um, basically Zoom calls to the university and also in classrooms to share this initiative. So we've probably done eight, I think, for NIU. Yeah. Um, All different levels. Yeah. 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 So it's 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 been really good for us because we've we've learned some things along the way. 
And we've learned that uh, our presentation needs to change based on who we're talking to. We know this when we're giving in-person uh, lectures. We know this when we walk into classrooms. You know this one, right? mm -hmm. um, you, you teach to your, to your uh, audience. But on Zoom, sometimes you just don't know. You don't know who you're talking to. And you can't see any sort of reactions. So it's it's been interesting. It is challenging, and that's why we provide those those resources because we don't know how people are thinking. So it's been it's been interesting, but yes, we are we are tied into that belonging brand. Thank you. Something else, and what are you doing? So really good questions. Um, it is part of the overall like research component. Um, we uh, have one of our uh, part-time people, um, Tammy Sherrod, is um, and she's a great part of the team because she is knows all, all the people to talk to, and um, again, talk about building trust. That I think people are going to be a little bit more maybe open to sharing their stories with her than they would be with her by myself. Um, so she is actively um, recording those videos as we speak. There is a new software, it's called Otter AI that we have purchased that will do uh, a pretty good transcription of those oral histories, which is phenomenal because normally with the oral history, it's about 15 minutes of the audio it takes you an hour to transcribe. And I'm terrible because I'm a multitasking person and you can't do anything else. You can have no other sound or anything except for this. Um, and then now the video or the, the, the software transcribes most of it. You still have to have some go back because there's still going to be mistakes, but it's better than like Alexa or Siri <laughs> in the transcription. So that really puts us ahead of the game in getting this information accessible. So the next step then is to have little snippets available from those interviews on the website when that is launched. Most, we're trying to keep these interviews to about an hour long. Uh, being said, if there's a whole lot more to talk about, we'll do it at another time, but it's pretty exhausting for one hour. The question about what are we doing with them though, is we just have about a month ago had a conversation with NIU. There is um, a new director of the Regional History Center and he had um, invited us um, as well as Rob with the Joint of History Room and through Vanna Creek from the library and the news library of talking about oral histories. Oh, and Christina Abreu, who is also doing the Latino oral history project with NIU. It's like all, all this work is going on. We need to, you know, have a, a little bit more connection here. And capture it. Yeah. yeah, and capture it and make it accessible. And storage was a big question because these are really big files. And so it's like, where, where did they go? Um, NIU has also been doing some black oral histories as well. So we've been working with them and you know, we want to share what we have. It's silly to you know, stay in those little silos. So that we haven't solved yet. Um, but again, accessibility is really important getting those transcriptions available. So that would be the plan, at least as of right now, is we'll have the little snippets available on our website. But if someone wants to see the full transcription, that would be available. I'm not sure where again those work the interview actual video will be available. But if someone really wants to see it, just we have it on our computers and just to get that available on the internet is a little tricky. How many do you have with the history of the centers? I know you say you know you've got it. Yeah. And that's how many do you have? So I have done personally two with Israel of God Church. Then there were two done at New Hope Church. We've got one done at the History Center. But there's about at least 10 people on the short list that we, we want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's, it's really exciting. And it's also, um, we want to make sure we're getting a different generation's perspectives as, as well from quite a few people that live here um, and their families have lived here. Their kids don't live here anymore. And so it's like we need to hear from them what their experiences were growing up. Is it? For job opportunities, or is it more than that? And we think for several of them, it's it's because of how they were treated. And it's been interesting too, because there is another wave of um, uh, people from Chicago that came out here, and just those different experiences of, well, why do you talk white? You're not black enough. And it's like, what does that mean? I've lived here my whole life. Oh, and 
So it just even, you know, within the Black community, again, different perspectives, different time periods, different experiences. So we definitely know that we're not going to have one or two people that are going to be telling the whole story for the Black community within this year. Just like everybody else, everyone here in this room would have very different experiences about living here, the same thing. So we really want to make sure that we're talking to men and women, people that have been through the generations, people that are new, and their kids. And with Zoom, we can certainly do that. So that, again, is a uh, helps it out and uh, with the possibility that two years ago I have, would have been really uncomfortable with. <laughs> so, Michelle, we have a question on the line. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Christy. Oh, we can't hear you. You muted again. Sorry. Okay. First of all, I just, I would like to say thank you. I think this is very um, important and helpful. Um, and I, I, particularly the census data, um, and I know you didn't cover that today, or maybe you said something. I, once in a while, things were a little tinny, so I wasn't sure if I was missing out on something, but um, that census data did so much for my imagination about, um, what's untold, like what's missing um, in the stories of DeKalb County. And sometimes I feel um, like I might get backlash poking around in Genoa because I haven't lived here all my life, but I did grow up in Crystal Lake. And I, and I think, you know, I've been kind of comparing and many of the stories are very similar. Um, but one thing I want to, to learn more about is um, people being able to live here. So um, I, is there a way to go to the um, courthouse and find out your own deed if you wanted to look up, say like your own deed and see if there were any restrictions? I did do a quick look through some books at the city hall that were kind of pulled together in Genoa and I noticed it, it was very much, it very much reminded me in a, um, when a new subdivision was coming along, it reminded me of the Ku Klux Klan, um, like their, their certificate that they give people. It's not blatant. They don't come out and say, um, you know, what, what they want people to do and what they're doing. And so it was kind of similar with the subdivision it said, something like, and I took a picture of it, so I might not get the words quite right, but I do have those words. Um, the, the integrity of the neighborhood should be kept um, maintained. And I think it was just a way to say, you know, only white people should be living there. I, I can't remember exactly how they said it, but that's kind of how I read it. And um, I, so that's kind of a big question, but. Um, how can we make sure we get that kind of information before it's destroyed? Because that's another thing I've noticed happening. People are very ashamed. And um, I, I, I feel like I'm not digging to make people feel embarrassed. It's just that those are stories. If someone was in the Ku Klux Klan or there was a robe, you know, upstairs in an attic, um, it's really a heavy thing. But you know, how do you make people feel like you're not trying to point fingers, or you know, it's just a responsibility all of us can embrace? And how do we have those kinds of conversations with people? Well, you raise a lot of, of good questions, and I, I want to start with kind of the, the last one first. Of it is hard to have these conversations, and people. Um, and feeling threatened and I that's why I have really appreciated working with Brian. It's like okay this is scary to do by yourself but at least if you have someone else that you can get into trouble with I guess um and that with that Illinois Humanities Grant that now that we're reaching to Genoa and to Kirkland and to Sandwich and to Hinkley um that there I don't want to say safety in numbers necessarily but there's more credibility to the projects that it's not just our town everybody had these and I think that perspective really makes a difference that it's just a, wow, look at those folks up in Genoa. Can you believe how terrible they were? This was a lot more common than yeah. we, I think anyone anticipated. And I think you're right with those census records, I think was eye-opening to everyone. And I think that's one of the things that I have learned is the whole time I like, 
we need to have these uh, relationships. I don't have anything in my collection that tells these stories. Well, guess what I did? I just wasn't looking in the right spots. Those census records right there that I use all the time. I have never looked up. We have a doctor's book where he wrote down the names of every single person um, that he, or every child that he delivered. They were listed in there by color. Um, they also have um, the, the factory newsletters that that's where we found Weaver Johnson's story. The stories are there. They're in telephone directories. You know, that there are these little bits. So yeah, we have to dig a little deeper. As far as finding these records though for property, um, what, like Brian had mentioned, we, we, we can find the subdivisions that started in the 20s. So, so that's kind of the low hanging fruit. If we know where those books were, those were developed. Then we have these copy books at the History Center. And then we can look at that tract of land and we can go back to 1840 when the land was purchased from the government. And then it goes see, and that's where we have found the, the uh, restrictive covenants for both the outfield uh, fish and, and for those in Sycamore. So that's kind of where I would start that. It's, it's a little tricky to figure out those subdivisions. Uh, I haven't found an easy way to do that, but um, we can certainly work with you to try and do some digging on that. The newspaper also advertises though. That was the other thing with the Elfield edition. I always kind of thought that um, this was the, under the radar. Like if you knew, you know, if you're looking at this land, you knew this was one where blacks weren't welcome, but we found a full page ad with the restrictive covenant on it. And so- It was part of the advertising. Come yeah. live here, it's safe. Yeah. Is, is basically what it was saying. Yeah. Hmm. So that also may be something to just kind of look through some of those newspapers in the 1920s. Thank you. And then just a, a last thing, when Mrs. Nearing gave us the, the Nearing house in the corner there of our property, which was originally the Perry Ellen home, um, Mrs. Nearing also had a, the official deed of the property. I had never looked through it. It was just like, oh, it's your house now, here's this. And I put it in a file. Well, after someone clued me into racial covenants of the neighborhood, I thought, oh, I've got this original deed. And I went through it and sure enough, it printed out the whole covenant right there as a full page. Um, so it's it's there embedded in the deed. So if you do get a, a full deed from the courthouse, it will be in there. Well, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. One more question. Yeah, how long will the display be upstairs? We're going to keep it up until July 5th. Is that the right date? Second. Second. July 2nd. The postcard, I'll give you a postcard. Thank you. We're going to sign off here.